You be going, man, stay, steer clear of that dude. Call the pastoral staff. They need to totally castigate that guy, approach the, confront him, right? No, they don't come in that way. They come in in an insidious way. They get, they get enmeshed inside the church and get to build friendships and stuff. Uh, and next thing you know, they're espousing false doctrine. Um, the, the same, the same uh, world in which we live. And so we are much in the similar situation uh, that when John wrote this letter around 80 AD, uh, the timing of the letter, to when he wrote the Revelation, uh, you're talking 15 years. And in that 15 years, the churches went south. And the sad thing is, those churches don't even exist anymore. That's the scary part. Because remember, Christ told them, if you don't repent, I'll remove your lampstand. So uh, the Lord is really big on following sound doctrine and following the commands and dictates to uh, live as you should. So why was the book written? So we want to look uh, quickly before we close as to why it was written. So uh, th there's much discussion as to uh, why it was written. And um, I want to read you 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. Because I used to be of this, this mindset year, years ago when I was a young man. But I had issues with it. But I didn't know how to think through my issues with said position. Uh, so 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. Some say this is, this is the theme of the entire book. So follow me on this. What's he, how does he close this book out? These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that it's a, it's a, it's a purpose clause in order that you may know that you have eternal life. Some people take that, as I used to when I was younger, in my 20s, I used to apply that to the entire book. When you do that, what happens is, um, and that particular phrase there uh, uh, is a prepositional phrase, these things. Um, when you take that and you apply that in the entire book, then you, the, in my estimation, wrongly assume that he wrote the book to tell the Christians in all of those churches, you're Christians, huh? That seems, like a, that seems illogical to me. But everybody says that. You know? It's like, well, that's, that's why he wrote the book. Uh, I, I don't agree with that position anymore because uh, of word usage. So that particular uh, prepositional phrase, these things, um, it occurs here, and it only occur, occurs in that uh, first-person uh, uh, singular mode one other time in, in the book of John. Uh, that's in 1 John chapter 2, verse 26, where he uses it there as well. And when he uses it in 1 John chapter 2, verse 26, these things, he's referring to what he just said, not the whole book. So therefore, if that's how he uses the term, why in the world would I get it to the end of the book and say, he ipso facto takes that prepositional phrase and it applies to the whole book, when that's not how he uses the phrase. See, if I believe the whole book is written that you can prove whether a person's a Christian or not, then I will read the book through that lens and assume everything it says about that is, is about that concept. Well, they're a believer because of this, and they're not a believer because of that. That's how you read the book. That leads to huge issues, as we will see when we get into the study. Remember, we're studying 1 John. This is introduction. So, so what's the book about? A uh, couple other things. Uh, the concept of these things uh, is also used uh, in chapter 5, verse 13, in a different, little bit grammatical change. And again, uh, in those contexts, like 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, uh, he's really talking about the things that I just told you. Not, not the book, but the things I just taught you is what I'm talking about, about who Jesus is, his person and his work. That's the stuff I told you about. And if you know the stuff I just talked about concerning who Jesus is, then you know you have eternal life. He's not talking about the whole book. So what's he talking about in this book? Uh, here's, this is important because this will color our entire thinking. Uh, in this particular book, in my view, uh, he, is, he is writing to talk about fellowship with God. Intimacy with Jesus, which is impacted by sin. Okay, can a Christian sin? Why are you so quiet now? Uh, he's going to probe into my life. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I had to probe into my life. So is it possible for a Christian to, to engage in carnal activity? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. If they didn't, I would lose my job. I mean, it's because it's, they do. And when they do, uh, you have to call them lovingly to come back to Christ. They repent of their sin. And, you, know, it's, you know, you have positional sanctification, that allows you to get into heaven when God sees you, boom, you have the righteousness of Christ. The problem is your daily walk, okay? Because you have a self-will. And so I think what's, what's happening in this particular book uh, is John, in the very introduction, tells you why he's writing his book. And he's writing about maintaining fellowship with Jesus in a society built on false doctrines and false teaching, masquerading as truth. And if you get sucked into those false systems, it's going to destroy your intimacy, intimacy with Jesus. You have to stop and ask yourself, am I believing anything right now that's contrary to sound doctrine, that is totally nailing my faith, and it's causing my intimacy with Jesus not to be as stellar as it once was, you need 1 John. 
Notice what he says in uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we, speaking of disciples, uh, have held, our hands have held, concerning the word of life, and the life was manifested. And we have seen and bear witness and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us in the person of Jesus. What we have seen and what we have heard, we, the disciples, proclaim to you. Why? What, notice the why. He tells you why. Uh, the purpose clause is that you may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write so that our joy may be made complete. What joy? Well, we know you're saved, but we know false doctrine is be, is, has split your churches. And there's not great fellowship in anymore between you and each other because false teaching puts saints against saints. And he says that you've lost that fellowship, and because you've lost that love and joy with each other, you've, by definition, lost that love and joy with Jesus. But I want you to get back to that. And so he says in uh, this book, let me write about how to maintain a deep abiding walk with Christ. A deep fellowship that even as the culture goes south, your church doesn't and your faith doesn't because you're in love with each other, because you're in love with him. This is a great book. Amen. Everything he says is going to be built around the concept of maintaining that abiding relationship. I don't know. I mean, the older I get, the more I think about it. Am I just learning things about God or am I walking with him? See, am I getting smarter in the faith, but am I abiding? obeying what I know. Because I know when I stand before him, he's not going to want to know how many books were in the Old Testament? What about those participles? Can you, <laughs> you think he's going to ask me that? What's he going to want to know? How hard did you follow me? Was your heart in it? Did you do it for the right reasons? Did you obey my commands? Did you love your brother as you love yourself? Etc. That's what he's going to be looking at. Did you stay true to sound doctrine, which led to sound living? Uh, I'm excited about this book because I think it's perfect for the day in which we live. We live in the same kind of culture where false taxonomies of false teachings are all throughout the culture and they're infiltrating churches and destroying them. I would say the greatest hope of our nation is the church of Jesus Christ and the gospel. Let's pray. God, thank you for the power of the gospel. It changes a person's relationship with you for eternity because we are now covered by the blood of Christ. It uh, changes a group of people that form themselves into a church because they are covered by the, the blood of Christ and they are empowered by the Spirit of God uh, to be the church, to be your hands and feet, uh, to each other, to the culture, and they are there also to share the gospel with those lost in falsity. May we learn much as we study this book. May we grow deep in our relationships with each other, deeper in our relationship with you, and may we repent of any of those things that mar those relationships. And we'll give you the glory as we do great things in your name uh, to lead many people into the kingdom of Christ. And with that in mind, Lord, we pray. Amen. It's good to have you in God's house today. Lord bless you.